Good. I guess you get the mic show tonight. Pastor's running a little behind, so he'll be here. So again, we're thankful that you all are here. We're so thankful for everybody coming out this evening. Um, I have one question that I'm going to talk about briefly, and we'll do some giveaways like we always do. I don't know, Kip, what we should give away, but there's all kinds of goodies here. So I know as well that the pastor has a DVD I think he wants to give, or a CD that he wants to give to everybody. But when he gets here, I'll let him handle that. Maybe whenever you guys are, are leaving, he'll give that to you. But before we start tonight, let's pray once again and ask the Lord to be here with us. Father in heaven, oh Lord, again, we are so thankful for the love that you show us. Lord, I pray this evening that as we go throughout the presentation this evening, as we go throughout the, 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 the presentation, everything that's going on through special music and all of these things, Lord, I just pray that you would guide our hearts. I pray that you would touch our minds. Lord, help us to, to make the decision to follow you in truth, to, to come into that fellowship of, with one another, Lord, to be able to continue to grow even after this seminar comes to a close. We know that this is not the end that this is only the beginning, Lord. And so we just pray that you would continually bless us, guide us, and lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, I do not see him yet, so I guess we can go ahead and do a giveaway, and then I will go ahead and I'll answer a question. I'll tell you what, let's do the question first, because there's still people coming in, so they get the opportunity. All right, so the question came from Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Remember we talked about uh, Satan, how he fell from heaven, right? How he was cast to the ground, he was cast to the earth. And so the question was regarding Revelation 12, 9. It says that the, let's see, the devil and his angels were cast down to earth, out from heaven, because of his constant rebellion. And my question is, were they cast down as spirits or flesh? And, I'm not sure what that word is, something people like us. And became people like us, maybe? And so we see, we know that Satan was a created being, wasn't he? He was a glorious angel. That's what he was created. His name was Lucifer, meaning luminescence. So he was a created angel. And we know that whenever he fell, his angels fell with him. So yes, the demons that were cast out, Satan, he is an angel. So they are not humans. Are you with me? They are not like us. They are not the same as us. The Bible actually says they're a little above us. And so I'm going to show you a verse for that. So go with me to, let's see here. Let's start in Psalms 104. And we're going to look at Psalms 8. Psalms 104 and verse 4. Psalms 104 and verse 4. Now notice what it says here in verse 4. It says, Who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. And so we see, my friends, that angels are not like humans. They are different. You remember whenever, um, whenever you had the, uh, the crucifixion in the tomb and, and the Roman soldiers, remember again, we talked about this a little bit. Remember the Roman soldiers, they were coming to get the body of Jesus, right? What was sitting on top of that rock or that stone? An angel. So what happened to these big, bad, burly soldiers? I mean, they were buff soldiers, right? With Rome, one angel, they just fell over because of the glory of one angel. So we know that we are not like that, right? Because we don't walk around and people just start falling over, do they? No. And so my friends, they are different than us. So now let's look at Psalms 8. <coughs> Psalms chapter 8 and verse 5. Psalm chapter 8 and verse 5. You notice what it says. For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. And so this is a psalm of David and it's talking about making him a little lower than angels. And we see, my friends, that whenever whenever we have angels, they are lower than human or we are humanity is lower than the angels. Are you with me? And so we see that that the angels are glorious beings that you don't see them. They're different than humans. We all have a guardian angel. Whenever Jesus comes back, whenever you look over, you see all these angels, you can get to see your guardian angel who helped you your entire life. Amen. So we know that they're a little different. Also, look at me with Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Again, remember, Satan's angels that fell, they were angels. And verse 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, which is what? Humanity. That's us. Are you with me? Flesh and blood. 
but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness, against this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, speaking of the demons and Satan and the principality and the things that are taking place. And it says what? In the heavenly places. So we can see clearly that angels, I'm not going to call them spirits. I'm going to keep calling them angels because that's what they are. They are angels. There are good angels that did not fall. There are bad angels that fell. Are you with me? And so we know them, the Bible refers to them as demons. So they're different than humanity, yes. But we are flesh and blood. They are created by God in a different atmosphere, if you will. They're higher than us. Does that make sense? All right. Pastor is here. There we go. Woo! All right. So now you have a lot of good stuff to give away. Oh, that's right. We had a special gift, too. Let me go get that. So how you all doing tonight? All right, it's good to see you all again tonight. And um, sorry, I'm a little bit late. I was over in Tampa, and that I-4 traffic just uh, is very unpredictable. So we we drove in the parking lot at exactly seven o'clock. <laughs> but I had to I had to put my tie on. So anyway, it's good to see all of you here. Here we are, our final night, our final giveaway. And uh, how's everybody doing? Doing good? All right. And of course, we're going to be also having more activities tomorrow. And I understand that uh, there is some refreshments that have been prepared for tonight. So if you want to stay by for that, we would love to have you join us for that. So, um, but we have our final drawing tonight, and so let's just see here. We uh, got a, a couple, so we have a special gift. Uh, let's see here. Julia Wickenmeyer. Okay, I've got to give this tell it to the world that's the history of the Adventist Church Oh, nice! yeah DVD about the history of the Adventist Church yes okay Nathan Ramsey Three angels, one message. Okay, great, great. And now we have an extra special gift tonight. Okay, and Chad. Oh, Chad Jr. Oh, it's still Chad, yeah. Well, this is a cool gift. This is a replica of the great image of Daniel 2. Okay. Uh, let me see. I think I'll give one more gift away here tonight. Since it's the last night. Jim Barwick. go final hope that's about the three angels message too and we also want to mention that at the end of the service tonight we're going to give everybody another special gift everybody's going to get a special gift for in, in celebration of the last night of the meetings and that is this uh this cassette or cd i should say excuse me cd uh that my wife made a number of years ago so everybody's going to get one of these at the end of the meeting tonight. Okay. So, uh, anything else? You already had opening prayer and everything? Yes, sir. All right. Very good. Very good. 
Uh, yes, special music by the praise team. All right. That's quite Sabbath. <laughs> it is. It's close by. Yeah. It's good. It's good. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, Amen. It's seven o'clock. Right? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Wow. So we get to the end. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather. His nail pierced hand than to be the king of the vast domain or be held in sin's dread way. I'd rather have Jesus than. Jesus than anything 
Good evening, Saints. How are we doing? Awesome. Again, I want to thank everybody for being here this evening. I, I can't believe this is our last presentation, right? I mean, where does time go? I feel like it has just flown by since we have gotten here. And again, we are very excited and very happy about tonight as well. Tonight is another very important topic that we're going to be covering. And again, I want to let you know it has been amazing studying with all of you, my family and I. We love every single one of you. And it has just been a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. You guys have made us feel so at home, so welcome. And again, we thank you for that. Me, my wife, my children, we all thank you and we all love every single one of you. Now, tonight's study is a very important study. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so what we're going to be looking at is this, this time period that we find in the book of Revelation. It's in Revelation chapter 20, if you want to follow along, known as this, this thousand year time period. And so this is a very important topic because remember, we, we've looked a lot about the second coming and deception and things that, that, are, that are arising, things that are happening. And, you know, remember we talked how so many people believe that whenever, whenever Jesus just poofs people away, then we spend seven years, right? on earth and you get a second chance but we need to understand this because this is the last great day deception another deception that satan is brewing up so that we would be deceived and not ready for when jesus comes to take us home now before we get started what should we do pray let's pray and ask the lord to be here with us father in heaven oh lord again we thank you we love you we praise you lord lord we ask for your guidance once again this evening we pray lord that you would guide us and lead us in this study I pray that we would have open hearts, open minds, Lord, to hear what you have to say. And I pray that it is you that is speaking to us. Father, I pray that you would pour your spirit out upon us. Let us empty our vessels. Let us empty of ourselves so that you can fill us with that precious oil. Lord, please guide us, lead us in the study this evening so that we can comprehend what's going on in the book of Revelation so that we can be ready. And help us also to apply these things to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So again, what we're looking at is, is another time period in the Bible. Again, I told you it's in Revelation 20. It's known as the thousand years. And this is, this is going to talk about a blackout, if you will, that's going to happen on the earth. This huge blackout that's going to take place. It's going to be this thousand year time period. So our title tonight is the thousand years of peace. What we're really going to be talking about is a time period when Satan is bound to this earth. So first, what we're going to do, remember again, I've told you how I love the stories in the Bible and how they really help to open our eyes. Now, when God first created the earth, no doubt it was perfect, right? Animals didn't fight each other. Humans didn't kill anything. It was just glorious. And it was beautiful. Nothing died. And I was just talking like up where we're from, you know, you call us snowbirds come down here to get out of the snow, right? Well, we have fall foliagers that come from here up to our area to look at the fall foliage. And so it's very beautiful, isn't it? You ever seen like pictures of fall foliage if you've never came? So Oakland, Maryland is a huge place that people come to visit to look in the fall when the leaves start changing colors. And I'm telling you, it's beautiful. But do you really know what's happening? The leaves are dying. There's actually death that's taking place within that tree that's causing it to change colors. And we look at it as beauty. Now, I'm going to tell you the colors are pretty. I agree. Whenever you see the yellows and the orange, oh, it's just magnificent. But we see, friends, that it's like we've gotten this mentality now that is completely slowing us around. Because when sin comes into the world, remember what the Bible says, that now there's thorns, now there's thistles. Gentlemen, whenever you go and you pick a rose, you don't just grab it, do you? No, because it hurts. It's got thorns in the, and everything on it. It will hurt your hand. And so with the entrance of sin, everything changes. Animals start fighting one another. Animals start eating one another. And then eventually even human beings start eating animals. It's just the complete opposite of the paradise that God had originally shown us. The Bible tells us this is, this is a result of sin that came in. Notice what it says in Genesis 3.17. Cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So something else that is cursed is not just, not just humanity, not just animals, not just plants, but even the what? The ground from which it grows. It says, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. And so probably, this is probably why I don't eat very well, because I'm not a green thumb. And evidently my dirt's worse than everybody else's. <laughs> Amen. Mine's been cursed even more. 
And so we see, my friends, that it's saying, look, the, even, the dirt, it, it, even the dirt is losing its vitality. It is even being corrupted because of sin. So up until this point in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they had an amazing job. Plants grew, they flourished. They, you didn't have to worry about ants and bugs coming eating your tomatoes, right? We were just talking about that. And, and, and so we didn't have to worry about any of those problems. They would, they, would, they would tame the vines, make things beautiful. This was their job, and this is what they did, and it was amazing, and it was glorious. But now, remember, we said the ground now brings, the, brings forth thorns and, and thistles. And we even see the ground is affected, and it's become corrupted, it's become perverted. And this is a curse that God has said would take place. Genesis 4.12 says, When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. And so we see that the, the vitality of the ground is even influenced because of this. And so what does God do? He's going to implement a law to help people out. So he implements this law. The land is to enjoy a Sabbath. It was to enjoy one year off. You can read about this in the book of Exodus. It says, six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat. You know, I remember Ruth. The story of Ruth, remember she was a poor person, right? She was going behind, gathering up what she could. And so this is what was to take place. They were to allow the, the during the volunteer years for the poor to eat. And so they were allowed to allow the land to enjoy a Sabbath. He was going to bless them. Remember Joseph? During the time of plenty, they had extra, didn't they? They stored up all of the extra and stored it for the years of whenever the famine was going to come. And so we know this is the exact same thing. He said, look, if you sow your seed for six years, then I'm going to give you extra. But you're to allow it to have a day off. If they let the Sabbath have this, this year, if they let the land have this Sabbath, this year off, if you will, he's like, look, I will open the storefronts of heaven for you. I will pour out crops for you. You will not go without. So doesn't God have a way of making nine tenths go further than ten tenths? Oh, man, I can testify to that all day long. It's amazing because he will give you even more than what you need. He will open the storefronts of heaven with you. But you can read in the Bible, there's actually no comment, no passage that references them actually letting the year take a, or the land take a year off. There's no reference in the Bible of them doing this whatsoever. And so we see, my friends, that evidently they just kept on farming, kept on sowing, kept on doing what they wanted to do. And then finally, after all these years of rebellion, after all of these problems, after all of this comes and, and they're, they're just rebelling against God, now judgment comes. The Bible tells us the king of Babylon, remember? Nebuchadnezzar, he came. What does it say in 2 Chronicles here? It says, Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all of its what? palaces with fire. And those who escaped from the sword, he carried away to where? To Babylon. Until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. In other words, God's saying, he's saying, look, Look, this king comes. Are you with me? This king comes and places judgment, shows judgment on them. Some die, some are not. Those that are spared, what happens to them? They go back to the golden kingdom, back to the, the golden empire, my friends. And during this time, the land keeps a Sabbath. Then during the time when they're in Babylon, what's the condition of Jerusalem? What's the condition of, of what's going on here? The Bible tells us, notice what it says here in Nehemiah 1.3. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. And so we can see clearly if the walls are broken down, if the gates are burning with fire, then what? That means it's destroyed. Are you with me? Jerusalem is ransacked. It's destroyed. It's burnt. We plainly see that it is desolate. Nothing is there. And so then after their 70 years, what happens? After their 70 years of captivity, they go back, don't they? And they rebuild the promised land, don't they? They go back, they return, they make a new Jerusalem, if you will. A new Jerusalem, and there's great rejoicing and shouting, and it's just beautiful. So let me draw the parallel for you, dealing with this thousand years. We're talking about the thousand years you find in chapter 20. Now, there, everybody that believes in prophecy believes in the millennium. But there's two principal views that we see within Christianity dealing with the millennium. The first view is, whenever, whenever people look at the millennium, they believe that, that it's going to be this time period where people are still on the earth. And some will even go on to say that, that, that the Jews will be reigning over those that aren't taken to heaven. 
They will say that we are literally reigning on earth for that thousand years. I respectfully disagree, my friends, because we're going to see in the Bible that that's not what takes place. And then there are Christians who believe that the millennial reign, the thousand year reign, is in heaven with Jesus Christ. That the saints, they go to heaven, they live and they reign with him for a thousand years. That's what I believe the Bible is saying. And we are going to see that from the word of God. For a thousand years, this world is going to keep Sabbath. It's going to be desolate. It's going to be fallow. There's going to be nothing here. And so how does this go with us? Remember, the, remember we just looked at that law to let the land enjoy its Sabbath. Six years you shall sow your seed, but the seventh year you shall let it what? Enjoy the Sabbath. And so what I, whenever we look at the thousand years, we see, my friends, this earth has been laboring for about 6,000 years now. Jesus has been sowing the seed of the gospel for 6,000 years. Then he comes to take his people home. Are you with me? And then it lays desolate. It lays fallow, just like literal Jerusalem, literal Jerusalem did for that, for that 70 years of captivity. It lays fallow. There's nothing here. And it enjoys a thousand year Sabbath. Are you noticing something similar? Remember six years, you shall sow your seed and labor, right? But the seventh is to enjoy a Sabbath. 6,000 years, my friends, this earth has been laboring. And then a thousand year time period, a thousand year time period, that makes how many thousands of years? 7,000 years. Have we seen this before? Six days shall you labor, do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath and it's going to rest. Are you with me? The Bible says a day with the Lord is as if a thousand years. And so again, we see, my friends, this is a perfect parallel that talks about the thousand years of revelation and what's going to take place. It's going to be desolate. It's going to be fallow during this. There's going to be nothing here. We live and we reign with Christ for a thousand years. Then we come back to the earth and he builds a new Jerusalem. There's rejoicing and there's a beautiful thing that takes place just like it was in the stories in the Old Testament. It works perfectly together. These stories are beautiful, my friends. So what events mark the beginning of the thousand years? What events mark the beginning of it? Let's look at 1 Thessalonians. We've looked at this verse, 416. It says, For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So now, what did we look at here? Remember, we talked about the second coming of Christ, didn't we? This is a picture of the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is known as the first general resurrection that takes place. It says what? And the rest of the dead, or the, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And it says, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. You find this in Revelation chapter 20. So we get what? The first general resurrection that takes place when? At the second coming of Jesus that we just seen in 1 Thessalonians. So the words they lived literally mean came to life. In other words, they've been resurrected. Are you with me? So what do we see here? The beginning of this thousand years, it starts with what? With Christ's return. It's, it means that and they live. They were resurrected. Now they're alive. And now they're going to reign with Christ. So when, what starts this thousand year time period? The second coming of Christ. And we see that the first resurrection happens when? At the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now some people, they've wondered, whew, man. I've heard you talk about, man, if a day, if a day equals a year in Bible prophecy, whoo, that's a long time, right? Man, that's like 360,000 years. Well, I'm telling you, I do not mind if that's how long I'm going to be in heaven with Christ. But I do believe it's a literal thousand years. Let me tell you why. When we are here on earth, the Lord is speaking to us through time prophecies. When we are in heaven reigning with him, he no longer has to do this. So we are going to live and we are going to reign with him for a literal 1,000 year time period. Revelation 20 verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the what? The first resurrection. And so we're going to look at the first resurrection right now. We'll look at the rest of the dead here in a minute. Now, we notice that the Bible clearly speaks of a first resurrection. Who is the first resurrection for? The saints, the holy, those that have been set apart, those that have been sanctified by God, they will be raised up out of the graves. And then remember in verse 17, we which are alive and remain, will what? Will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. So this is the first general resurrection that we see in scripture. The wicked people, those that did not follow Jesus, those that have chosen to follow their own commandments, their own ways, man-made traditions, 
they don't have part in the first resurrection. Now, Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 says, Behold, he is coming with clouds. Every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And so we know there's going to be a little special resurrection when he comes as king of kings and lord of lords. He's going to be, look, I told you. Amen? He's going to show the ones that put him on the cross that, look, I am the king of kings and I am the lord of lords. Are you with me? And he's going to show them that it's beautiful. Now, the 1,000 years that we look at in Revelation chapter 20 is often called the millennium. Now, the word millennium is not found in the Bible. Are you with me? But the word millennium is a very, very simple word. It is a composite of two Latin words. Mill, I mean in 1,000 years and any meaning, or meaning 1,000 and any meaning years. So simply, when you talk about a millennium, it is 1,000 years. It begins at the first resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then we're going to look at a second resurrection that's going to happen later on. This is dealing with the wicked. And there's a thousand year span that happens between the two. So we see that, and they lived, right? That's the first resurrection. This is what starts the thousand years. Then you have a time period. And then we're going to see that there is a second resurrection. So look, there's going to be a whole chart at the end. You can take a picture of it. All right. Amen. So we see the millennium starts at the second coming. When Jesus comes, we have the first resurrection. The wicked are slain. We'll study that in a minute. The wicked dead remain in the graves. And then the saints, they go where? The saints go to heaven. So what else will happen at the first resurrection? Let's notice this. Dealing with Jesus' coming. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In other words, we're getting those glorious bodies. Are you with me? Because that's one of the questions I always wondered dealing with Jesus' coming and dealing with what happens when we die. If when I die, I immediately go to heaven, why do I need to be changed at the second coming? Or why is there even a resurrection? Because I don't want this body. I want that body. I want the glorious body that he's promised me. Are you with me? And so it tells us that we will be changed. We'll be given our immortal bodies. And so it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 53, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. In other words, nobody's put on immortality yet. Are you, are you with me? We must put it on. And when does this take place? At Jesus' second coming. Now, here's a question. How amazing does immortality sound? Oh, amen? You mean I don't have to be like a robot man walking around with an insulin pump and a, a sensor checking my sugar all day long. And you don't have to worry about any of these things anymore. Canes, walkers, wheelchairs. It's all done. It's all going away. No more. Remember we talked about prophetic prescriptions. No more man-made prescriptions. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord, man. If that don't get you excited, I don't know what will. Are you with me? It is something to look forward to. It says, who will transform our lowly body that I may be conformed to what? His glorious body. This happens at the second coming of Christ. In the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. We will put on immortality. The corrupt will be gone. And we will be living with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So at the second coming of Christ, all the saints are going to receive all those glorified bodies. I just get so excited whenever I see the Bible telling me that, look, this stuff is done away with. No more peeling skin. No more sunburns. Amen. Remember what happened whenever we first came down? I told you we went to the beach for a few hours and no sunscreen. I'm still peeling. Are you with me? And, and so we don't have to worry about that anymore. It's just going to be glorious and it's going to be beautiful. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering. But here's the thing. We want to make sure that we are sanctified by Jesus. Are you with me? In other words, sanctified means to be made holy, set apart. So we want to make sure that we are part of that because what happens to the wicked when Jesus comes? They will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume and destroy with the, the brightness of his coming. And so we see that, my friends, the wicked, it, it, they will be destroyed by Jesus' coming if they have clung on to their sins. Because God is a consuming fire, the Bible says. He consumes sin. Sin simply cannot be in the presence of God. It can't be. And so when he comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, if we're clinging on to our pet sins, then what's going to happen? It can't be in his presence. I cannot stress that enough. But I need to clarify, this is not hellfire. Are you with me? This is not hell yet. We're not there yet. We will get there later on in the study. But notice some other things that happen when Jesus comes. It says, and there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as not had occurred since men were on the earth. 
In Revelation 16, verse 20 and 21 says, Then every island fled away, the mountains were not found, and a great hail from, or a, yeah, a, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a, about the weight of a talent. Do you know how big that is? That's anywhere between like 75 and 100 pounds, my friends. That is huge. Can you imagine? At the second coming of Christ, there's going to be an earthquake that has never been seen before. Islands will fall into the waters. Mountains will be gone. They will be done away with. It will be utter chaos, my friends. It will be destroyed. And then you add to that hailstones, the weight of a talent? I mean, can you imagine? Y'all know what the world record for, the, with either, at least within the United States, the U.S. record for hailstone size is. So from what I know, it's actually from 2010, and it happened in Vivian, um, Vivian, South Dakota. And this was an eight inch wonder. It was eight inches round, and it fell to the ground there. How much do you think it weighed? About two pounds. Eight inches round, it's about the size of a volleyball, I think. And it only weighed two pounds. Can you imagine how massive a hailstone that weighs almost 100 pounds is gonna be, and the destruction that it's gonna cause? My friends, this land is going to be desolate. That's what we're going to see here in a minute. It says, then I saw, so what happens next? It says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So this is the part a lot of times where people get hung up, talking about the bottomless pit, right? What is the bottomless pit? I mean, is that somewhere out in outer space somewhere? Or is that somewhere within the center of the earth? What, what's the bottomless pit? This is a place that we often get hung up on, especially when you grow up hearing that when you die, you immediately get checked into hell or you immediately go to heaven because it's like, it's like Satan's within this bottomless pit somewhere and he's checking people in, right? This is the mentality that you get when you fall into these deceptions. So what is the bottomless pit? You know, the word that's used for bottomless pit is the Greek word abusos. You know what that means? without form and, and void. So in other words, this is the same state that the earth was in, remember? Without form and void before God created the earth. Are you with me? So there will be nothing on this earth. It will be the abyss. There will be nothing here. It will be without form and void. void. So the abyss for the devil represents the earth with nothing on it. This is torture to him. You know why? He's not interested in haunting two by fours and four by fours and six by sixes. He doesn't care about that, does he? No. What happened with Satan? He took the place of a, of a serpent, didn't he? What happened to the demons when Satan cast them out of the demoniac? Did they want to just go anywhere? No, they filled the, the pigs. And so we see, my friends, that they fill pigs. They don't want to be in nothingness. They want to possess. So when the devil has nobody or no living thing to possess, this is the greatest form of torture for him. Now I'll tell you a funny story. My family and I, we went to California. We were out there for three and a half months. So the first time we went out, we went out, it was for a weekend. We go out, we go across the I-80, which goes to the, the northern part of the country, right? Goes across the northern part. The second time we're like, you know what? We want to see something different. We don't want to go across 80 this time. So we go across 70. 70 goes through the, the middle of the country. But I-70 actually ends a little past Denver, right into Utah a little bit. And so Route 50, you ever heard of Route 50? Route 50 goes from coast to coast across the country. And so when we get out, look, I've been through Nevada, across 80, and it's just boring. There's nothing there. So whenever we, I mean, it's beautiful for the first 10 minutes, but then everything starts to look the same. It's just big mountains with no trees. It's like a mountain desert. And so whenever, whenever we're going across 70, we come to 50. I'm like, oh, let's get on 50. Because I knew that Route 50, I looked on my map, right? Not on my map, but on my phone, the digital map. And so I looked and like, I know Route 50 goes into Folsom, California. Folsom, California is just a little south of where Amazing Facts is. And so we're going to go across 50. And we're going to go through this beautiful mountains. You know, you see, you see signs that say there's wildlife, watch out for it. No, there's not. And so whenever we're going to cross 50, we go and praise the Lord, we filled up our gas tank before we got on this road. And so we're going across Route 50 and we're like, Woo -doo -doo, we're having a good time, right? So I wanted to do this because I didn't want to go through Reno. I didn't want to go up into that mess anymore. And so we start doing this and we are driving, we're driving, we're driving for hours and hours and hours. How many cars do you think we've seen? Zero. Guess how many animals we've seen? 
Goose egg, zero. So we get off of this road, right? There's no cell phone service neither. So make sure if you go across Route 50 through Nevada, you fill up before you get on Route 50 because there's no gas stations. There's nothing there. It's the nothingness. It's, it's, it's the abyss. It's the abusos. And, and so whenever we're going across it, we get to the end of it. Remember I said I didn't want to go to Reno? Guess what? We end up in Reno anyways because there's no civilization anywhere near us. So we have to go all the way up north like I didn't want to do and end up in Reno to stay there anyways. But... We get to the end. We finally get cell phone service. I do a Google search. We find out this is the loneliest road. And I'm like, oh, Lord. Whew. And I'm telling you right now, it is the loneliest road. There is nothing there. You have, I think it's Great Basin National Park. Why it's even there, I have no idea. By the time we got to it, it was closed anyway. So we just had to pull in and leave. We didn't even get to go to the bathroom. We just had to keep on going. And so we get to Reno. I find out this is the loneliest road. And I'm just like, man, like, this is just a, a few hours, and it's like we're being tormented, right? We're just like, what in the world is going to happen? Can you imagine a thousand years of nothingness? A thousand years of nothingness, my friends. We're only on that route. Look, Satan is going to be bound to this earth for a thousand years with nothing here. Him and his demons will be bound with no one to possess, nothing to do. This is the abyss, the abyss that he has cast into, that he has laid hold of. It is not a bottomless pit somewhere out in the universe. It is not a bottomless pit that is down within the center of the earth somewhere where Satan's like, all right, I got you, and I'm going to flip you over. Make sure you don't get too crispy on one side. That's not in the Bible. That's not true. Satan is not in charge of hell. He's going to be cast into hell. Are you with me? And so we see, my friends, that's what the bottomless pit is dealing with. So the millennium, the beginning, you have the second coming, which is the first resurrection. All right. And this is when the wicked are slain. Remember, they are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. The wicked dead remain in the graves. Only the saints are risen at the first resurrection and they are taken to heaven with Jesus. So the saints go to heaven during the thousand years. Satan is bound. Now, we're going to study this other part here in a minute. The saints in heaven doing work of judgment, and this earth remains desolate. All right, moving on. So is there any chance of being saved after Jesus comes? Because remember when we studied the tribulation, the seven years? It's this, this, it's this second chance theology. That's just not in the Bible, and it leads people to put off their salvation. So is there any chance of being saved after Jesus comes? No. no. Who would be left to be saved? Where are the saints? They're in heaven. Where are the wicked? They're slain. They're dead. They're destroyed. There will be nobody else to be saved, my friends, because it's going to be desolate. They're all dead, my friends. These are Satan's delusions and deceptions to get us to fall into putting off our salvation, to get us to fall and say, look, when these people start doing that poofing away thing, I'll start getting my act together. No. That's not what the Bible is teaching. That's not what the Bible is saying. Your second chance is given to you at the cross of Calvary, not after he comes. Are you with me? Amen. The Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today is the day. Look, you're not promised five minutes from now. That's why I keep telling you, you have to make a choice. You have to make a decision. Who do you serve? Are you willing to put aside tradition? And are you willing to say, look, I want to come into a commandment keeping church. That's why this is so important. Because the Lord says there's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. He calls us into that body. Remember in the book of Acts it says that they added to the church daily those who were being baptized. And so we see, my friends, just like on the, with Noah. It's just as imperative to belong to the, the commandment-keeping church today as it was to enter the ark on Noah's day. That's it. My friends, he's clearly calling us out of Babylon into a commandment-keeping church. Are you with me? Yes. That we were not deceived, that we don't fall into these deceptions that Satan is lining up for us. So who will be raised in the second resurrection, and when will it take place? We don't want to be part of this group. Are you with me? We want to be part of the first resurrection, the one where we go to the heaven with Jesus. We live for a thousand years, and we reign with him. Or if you're alive when he comes back, then you're caught up to meet him in the air. That's the group we want to be a part of. Amen. Amen. So what happens dealing with the second resurrection, and when does it take place? Remember, the Bible says in John 5, we've looked at this a lot. It says, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming. Remember these words I told you is very important because they change the meaning of a sentence. The hour is coming in which all who are in the what? Graves. Graves. Who would that be? The dead. Those that are dead, whether they're wicked or whether they're saints. Those who are in the graves will hear his voice. In other words, 
They have not heard his voice yet. That's why I've told you. If you have already faced the Lord and he's going to either put you in heaven or check you into hell, do you think you would have heard his voice? Yes, the Bible is very clear though that those in the graves, they have not heard his voice yet. It says the hour is coming. It says those who have done good to the resurrection of life, we see two resurrections. And those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now these are not special resurrections, but general resurrections. So again, we see two of them, don't we? The resurrection of life. Who is that for? That is for the saints, the godly, those that have given their lives to Jesus Christ. That's the one that takes place at the beginning of the thousand years. And then we get a picture of this second resurrection. So who would that be for? Those that have not resurrected yet, those that have not been brought forth from the grave. Jesus calls the first one the resurrection of life for the saints. The second one is for the, the wicked. So when does that take place? Revelation 20 and verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So here's the question. Here's the question that I got to ask. Who's the rest of the dead? Because you have the first general resurrection that takes place at Jesus' second coming, right? And they are the saints. They are those that are taken to heaven. So who are the rest of the dead? Because it says, but the rest of the dead did not live until the thousand years were over. The saints are in heaven. They've already been resurrected. So something else has to happen. Who would it be? The only ones that it could be is the wicked. That's it. Because remember, they're destroyed by the brightness of his coming. And those that are dead and in the graves that are of the wicked, they were not resurrected in the first resurrection. So when are they raised to life? What's the Bible say? The rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years are, are finished. So when will that be? It's very common sense. That's at the end of the millennium. That's at the end of the thousand years. That's why I said sometimes when we read the Bible, it's like we got our own thoughts and our own feelings involved. And we start reading things, we want to make it say what it doesn't say, right? That's why we need to let the Bible speak and not our thoughts and our, and our own opinions. Remember, we said, we're not saved by our opinions. We need to know what the Bible says. And this is what it says. Are you with me? And so we see, my friends, the resurrection of condemnation takes place at the end of the thousand years. That's why we say there are two general resurrections, the ones Jesus spoke of. Resurrection of life for the saints take place at the beginning of the thousand years. Then you got a thousand year time period. Then you have the next resurrection, which takes place at Jesus' third coming, known as the resurrection of condemnation. And Revelation 20, verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. They will reign with him a thousand years. So this resurrection of condemnation, again, takes place at the end of the thousand years. So in what condition will the earth be left after the devastating earthquake and hailstorm that begin the thousand years? Remember, we looked at some things that take place at Jesus' second coming. So let's notice what happens here. Imagine the chaos. Think of, like I was saying before, the destruction. Of these hailstones, for example. It just boggles my mind that the, that the, that the U.S. record is this 8-inch wonder. It only weighed 2 pounds. And I'm like, man, a, a, a soccer ball size hail or a volleyball, whatever, whichever one. I don't care. They're both big. And a hailstone this big, and you're telling me it only weighed 2 pounds? And you're telling me the Bible is saying that 100-pound hailstones are going to fall on this planet. I mean, that's just, if that doesn't just boggle your mind, I don't know. It's amazing, my friends. It's It's crazy. And remember, the mountains are flattened, the islands sink away. And add to that all of the dead that are destroyed by the brightness of his coming that are all over the earth. Notice what it says here in Isaiah 24. It says, the Lord makes the earth, what? Empty and makes it waste. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. This is what we see in Isaiah. You know, Jeremiah also sees something very interesting dealing with the coming of the Lord. In Jeremiah 4, it says, I beheld the earth and indeed it was, what's this word again? Without form and void. In other words, there's nothing here. It's without form, it's void. The heavens, they have no light. So when we see this, God is in some degree going to return the earth to a way it was before it was created. Are you with me? So it's going to be the abyss, the abyss, nothing. It's going to be without form. It's going to be void, a thousand year blackout. So we know that there's going to be no humans living here during that time. Are you with me? That's why we see clearly there's no such thing as seven years of tribulation. We know that the thousand years are not the millennial reign of the Jewish nation or whatever you believe. 
thinking that they're here reigning over the saints or the wicked, and all these things are taking place during this time period. It's not biblical. It's not in the Bible. The earth is destroyed. It says, I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled. I beheld, and indeed there was no man. And all the birds of the heavens had fled. That means they were, but now they're gone. It says what? There was no man. There's nothing here. It's destroyed. It's without form. It's void. Moving on, it says, I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a, a wilderness, and all the cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. That's not back in Genesis, is it? No, this void world is empty. It's rendered that way by the destruction of his second coming when he comes to take us home. This is what we see, my friends. We want to be ready for that glorious day. Amen? Amen. That's why we need to give our hearts to the Lord and allow him to cleanse us. Look, a lot of dear Christians believe, and I've talked about this a good bit, and I want to be as nice as possible, but they believe that whenever this poofing away thing starts to happen, that they're going to say, look, I'm going to get my act together. I just said this a minute ago. But I cannot stress this enough. Your second chance is not given to you after Jesus is coming. Your second chance was given to you at the cross of Calvary. It is now when he is preparing us for that glorious day, my friends. We clearly see that this teaching of, of seven years of tribulation, it's not biblical. It's not in the Bible. And yet it's like so many people are so deceived about these things. They are so deceived. I remember I told you, when you go and you look for the Left Behind series in the library, it's in the fiction section. It's not even real. It's made up stories. So when you base your salvation off of these books, you're basing your salvation off of books that are meant to pique your curiosity. To get some money out of you, to get you to watch their movies, to get you to buy their books. It's not biblical. My friends, is our salvation based upon opinions and made up stories? No, my friends. We see the seven year, the biggest problem is the seven year period, it leads people to put off their salvation. And we clearly know that we need to give our hearts to the Lord now. Amen. That's the most important thing you can do. Amen. What did Jesus say? Do you love me? You know, he's asking you that question today. Do you love me? Do you want to follow him? Do you want to commit your life to him? My friends, you do not get another chance to repent when Jesus comes. Now is the time. And you demonstrate your love for him by committing your life to him, by following him, by allowing him to clean up house, and by joining him through baptism, through rebaptism, through profession of faith, by coming into that church and allowing him to guide you, my friends. Because again, you hear a lot of people say, man, oh, when I see that disappearing thing, I'll get my act together. But that's not going to work. Because you'll be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. That's what the Bible is teaching and that's what it is saying. That's not what I'm saying. That's what the word of God is telling us. And at that day, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth, even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, nor gathered, nor buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. Well, what is that? Refuse is garbage. They will be rubbish. They will be destroyed. It will be garbage laying on the ground from one end of the earth to another, my friends. So we want to walk that narrow path. We want to walk that path that the Lord is calling us to so that we can be ready for that glorious day. They won't be mourned. They won't be buried. Why? Because nobody will be alive to mourn them and nobody will be alive to conduct funerals. Are you with me? It's not biblical that people are going to be alive on this earth after Jesus comes. That's not what the Bible is teaching. Satan will be bound to this planet for a thousand years. This broken down, desolate, void earth. That's what's going to happen during this time period. He is bound. And again, it's the greatest form of torture because he wants to haunt people. He wants to possess people. You know, what did Satan say? Basically, what was he saying? He's like, I will exalt myself above the stars of heaven. I will be the most high, right? He's like, look, this is my kingdom. I can do a better job. Is that what he was thinking? That he could rule us and lead us better? Yeah, now he's going to get a chance to sit here and think about what he did. He's going to get a thousand year time out, if you will. Are you with me? And so he's going to get to sit here and think about all of these things, my friends. So where will the saints be during the thousand years? And what will they be doing during this thousand year time period? Remember, Jesus said, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So where do we go? Where is Jesus? He's in heaven. So when he comes to take us home, he's prepared a place for us where? In heaven. That's where he's taking us. The millennial reign of Christ is... It's in heaven, my friends. 
We will be with Jesus in all the glories of heaven. There it will be a new Jerusalem that we will be spending our time in with him during this time period. So what does the Bible say that the saints will be doing in heaven? That's a very good question, isn't it? Revelation 20 and verse 4 says this, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So during the thousand years, the saints are actually going to get to participate in the judgment. Do you know that? Now here's the thing. You do not get to decide who is saved and who is lost. Are you with me? That has already been decided. God already knows during that time who is saved and who is lost. But they will participate in the judgment. That's why John said, and I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. You know the Bible declares that we will judge angels? Did you know that? Notice what it says here in 1 Corinthians 6. It says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that, they, that we shall judge angels? So during this thousand year time period, the saints will be up in heaven participating in the judgment. Again, you do not get to decide who is saved and who is lost. Let's be very clear. But you will be participating in it. The fairness of God's punishments for the lost will be affirmed, as will the rewards of the saints. You're going to see how just God is, how true He is, how righteous He is. For example, say you get to heaven and your beloved pastor's not there. But then you look at you've seen somebody that was on the news that was an infamous murderer and they're in heaven. You're going to be like, man, what went wrong? Aren't you? You're going to have some questions, right? And so we're going to get to see the books. Everything is going to be open. We're going to affirm the judgments that God has given and rendered, my friends. The Lord wants us to enter eternity trusting Him. He hides nothing from us. So when you get to heaven and you're wondering what is going on, you're going to be, the books are going to be open before you, and you're going to get to see everything, my friends. Now, the saints, their sins are blotted out. Are you with me? We are promised that they are blotted out by the blood of the Lamb. So the sins of the saints are blotted out of the book. But the sins of the wicked, they're not promised that. So we will get to affirm and we will get to see how true and righteous His judgments really are, my friends. Now, again, the sins of the righteous are under the blood. Very important to understand. So the sins of the wicked are the ones that we will see. So what will happen at the close of the thousand years? It says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So when Christ comes the third time at this coming, what's taking place? The new Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, right? But before it actually happens, before it sets on the earth, something happens. What will happen next to free Satan from his prison? Notice what takes place. Again, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were, were finished. So, when the thousand years are finished, the rest of the dead are going to be raised. They're going to be resurrected at the third coming of Christ. Remember, the second resurrection that we are seeing is for the wicked. First resurrection for the saints, second for the wicked. So, this is when they are resurrected. Now, in verse 7 it says, Now when the thousand years had expired, Satan will be released from his prison. So why does Satan need to be released from his prison? Why, why doesn't God just wipe him out at the beginning of the thousand years? Right? That's a good, good question. That's a legitimate question. You see, keep in mind, Lucifer, he was, he was the highest of God's created beings. Remember Lucifer, luminescence, he was a beautiful, glorious angel. He was not second, he was not third, he was the highest. So what will Satan do when the wicked are raised? This is why he's not destroyed at the beginning of the thousand years. Notice what it does here. Verse 8 says, And will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Verse 9 says, They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. Look, God's showing the first thing Satan does, as soon as he's released from his prison, the first thing he does is he goes to deceive again. He's chronic. He will not change. He is showing the entire universe that every single chance was given for every single person to repent of their sins, to change their ways, and to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's showing how chronic Satan is. Gog and Magog, these, these are like the enemies of God. They're found in Ezekiel chapter 8. It even says that, that they cover the earth as a cloud. They have come against my people. So Gog was a tribe against God's people, and Magog is this anti-Christian party. And we see that Satan is going to be deceiving. He's like, look, I shouldn't have been kicked out. I should, this should have never happened to me. And so they're going to surround the camp, and they're going to try to overtake. 
He's going to deceive everybody in believing again that it was not fair that he was evicted out of heaven. And they're going to surround the camp and they're going to try to take over the camp. So at this crucial moment, what will stop everything? Notice what it says in verses 11 and 12. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the, written in the books. So God's throne is going to suddenly appear, my friends, above the city. They call it the great white throne judgment. And this assault is instantly brought to a halt. You want to know how amazing God is? The books are going to be opened. Everybody's going to get to see how true and righteous he is. The just and the unjust. Every single person is going to get to, I heard one amen. Every single person, I don't care if it was wicked or if it's the saints, the books are going to be open. They're going to see how fair and how righteous God is. Do you see what's going on? He even opens the books for the wicked to show them that he did everything that he could to bring them into that relationship, to follow him in all truth. Their lives are going to be brought to flash before their eyes, if you will, and they're going to be reminded that they didn't choose him, that they chose the pleasures of the world rather than God. So what will happen after the wicked are judged? The Bible says, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. They're going to see again how true and righteous he is. Philippians 2, 10 and 11 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth that... And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Revelation 19, 1. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord who? Our God. He's showing how true, how righteous he is, my friends. For true and righteous are his judgments. Because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with what? with her fornication. That's why I keep telling you, if God is pleading to your heart, come out of her, my people. So we see clearly that great harlot, we've already studied it. And we know what's taking place within that harlot, my friends. All of the deceptions, all of the defiling doctrines are creeping within the harlot, within Christianity. And he's calling us out of that into a commandment keeping church. That's following the truth. And I have told you, there is no other church that's doing it. I have searched high and low, and I told you myself, if I ever found a church that was closer to prophetic fulfillment and closer to the Word of God than the Adventist church, I'd be going to that church. But this is the church, my friends. There is no other that's teaching the truth. I can tell you that right now. And I have searched, and I can know from experience, there is no other that is standing tall on the truth in God's Word. And so He's calling us out of those churches that aren't teaching the truth. He's calling us to come into a church that is following the Bible and the Bible alone. Now, after this universal mission, after every knee bows and after every tongue confesses how true and righteous he is, what happens next? So what's going to happen after this takes place? Revelation 20 verse 9 says, And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. It devours them. It does not say that fire comes out of heaven, sinks them into the middle of the earth somewhere, and burns them throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. It says it what? It devours them. This is hellfire, my friends. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the, the lake of fire. This is the second death. This is very important to understand because the wages of sin is death. The Bible does not say the wages of sin is never-ending torment throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. It does, you can get tongue twisted on that sometimes. You gotta say it quite <laughs> to get used to it. So the Bible does not say that. It says the what? This is the, the second death. There is no coming back from this death. And I'm telling you, my friends, the Bible says there will be gnashing of teeth. Because a lot of people will say, look, you don't believe in hell. Oh, yes, I do. In fact, the hell that I believe in is even hotter because it devours people and it burns them up. They will be no more. God promises affliction will not arise a second time. The devil will have no control over this. It is the second death. That is the punishment for sin. Death. What is death? Absence of life. Those that are sinners and those that, that do not follow God do not get immortality. That's not what the Bible is teaching. They are turned to ashes under our feet. And again, this is the second death. So, what starts the thousand years? First coming... Or the, yeah, the second coming and the first resurrection. So what? then we have the thousand year reign. Then we have the second resurrection. The holy city descends. This is his third coming when he's bringing the Jerusalem down. The new Jerusalem from heaven. And he's bringing it down to earth. 
but we live and we reign with Christ in heaven for this thousand year time period while the land enjoys its Sabbath. So after the fire goes out, what will God do for his people? Man, are y'all excited? Oh man, come on. Amen. I got a couple. Y'all excited for what God's going to do for his people? Amen. Isaiah 65 verse 17 says, For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. The former shall not be remembered, nor come to, to mind. Revelation 21 verse 1, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth have, have passed away. 2 Peter 3 13, We according to his promise, we look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And so after the 70 years of their captivity in Babylon, remember, the children of Israel return to the promised land, don't they? They rebuild the temple. They rebuild the city. There is great rejoicing. After the thousand-year Sabbath, after the land is desolate, we return to this earth. There is created a, a new heavens and a new earth. New heavens is your atmosphere. There's nothing wrong with heaven. It's the atmosphere that it's speaking of. And so there is a new atmosphere, if you will, a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The Bible promises affliction will not rise a second time, my friends. You can find that in Nahum chapter 1 and verse 9. And so we see, my friends, that it's not, their sin will be done away with. It'll be gone. We can live for eternity. Eternity with our Lord and Savior. Man, y'all excited? Come on, somebody. This is amazing. We will live with him forever. So where will God and the righteous finally live? This is something that's very amazing that you don't hear people talk about a lot. Revelation 21 verse 3 says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with who? Men. Is with men. And he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Do you realize how amazing this is? Out of the entire cosmos, God wants to dwell with us. Oh, come on. If that doesn't excite you, my friends, the God of the universe, the King of kings, the Lord of lords wants to dwell with humanity, wants to dwell with us. When he creates a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, he will be there with us throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Amen. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the, the earth. Heaven will be, earth will be restored. It will be glorious the way that it was meant to be, my friends. All right, so here's your chart, the final one, if you want a picture of it. The second coming starts the thousand years and the first resurrection happens at the, the second coming. The wicked are slain by the brightness of what? By the brightness of his coming. We see that the wicked dead, they remain in the graves. Remember, they do not have part in the first resurrection. They remain dead in the graves. Now the saints at the second coming, we, we which are alive and remain, the dead in Christ rise first. We go up to meet him in the air and he takes us to live in that place that he is preparing for us. During the thousand years, Satan is bound to this earth. The saints are in heaven doing work of judgment. Again, you do not get to pick who is saved and who is lost. Are you with me? I praise God he is doing that work. Amen? So we do not get to pick who is saved and who is lost, but we will get to affirm the judgments that have taken place. The books will be opened. The earth remains desolate during this thousand year time period. The new Jerusalem descends at the end of the thousand years. You have the second resurrection, which is for the wicked. The wicked attempt to take the city. Fire destroys the wicked. That is hellfire. It devours them, the Bible says. This is the second death. Then after the land has enjoyed its Sabbath for this thousand years, and it is laid desolate, it is utterly destroyed, then God creates us a, a new heavens and a new earth. Remember, in which righteousness dwells. Affliction will not arise a second time. Friends, this is beautiful. This is amazing. I long for that day. Are you with me? Man, I don't know of a Christian that doesn't long for the day when Jesus takes us home. Are you with me? It's going to be such a beautiful and glorious day, my friends. So there was this group of guys. They were traveling home. They were out playing golf and they were traveling home one evening. And as they're driving down the road, they, they notice something. They look off in the distance and they see off in the distance this, this big cloud of smoke. And as they're driving, they get up to where this smoke is and this, it's a smoldering house. It's obvious that it had burned during the night. And so as they pull up to this house, they get there, they see this woman and her children standing outside. And so they pull over, they get out and they ask her if she's okay. And she says, I'm fine, we're safe, we're out of the house. But man, we've just lost everything. And so each one of them, they pull out a few dollars out of their wallets. 
they hand it back to the, uh, they hand it to this woman, they give their few dollars, maybe a hundred bucks total between all of them. And they say, may God bless you. And they get in their car and they drive away. So as they are driving away, this guy that's driving, he, he turns to the guys behind him. He says, all right, y'all take out your wallets. Give me the money that you have. We're going to go back and we're going to give it to this woman. So they all take out their wallets. The guy even writes a check for over a thousand dollars. And they take it back and they return and they see this woman standing there. And so the guy, he gets out of the car, they all get up and they all walk up to her. He takes off his hat and he says, that money that we just gave you, we're going to need it back. And this lady, she just looks at him like, do you see the house that just happened? I mean, yeah, thank you for, for the few dollars, but, but you know, maybe this could help me get some food for my children because we've lost everything, right? But she just looks at him and says, okay, you know, here's the money. Without even thinking about it, she hands it back to them. She puts it in the hat. Then all of a sudden, this guy, he gets all the money out that they had in their wallets in this check. He puts it in the hat and hands it to her. And he says, we'll be sending you more. Amen. You know, we don't have much, do we? And all that we do have, God gave us in the first place. And you know, he doesn't ask us to do anything that we cannot do. He's asking us to surrender our lives to him. To give all that we have to him. And again, we don't have anything to give but our lives to him. Because everything we have, it came from him in the first place. You know, friends, Jesus is waiting with a longing desire. I long for that day. He's waiting with a longing desire to come to take his saints home. For us to turn from our selfish ways. To say, Lord, I want to surrender to you. Is that your desire tonight? To say, Lord, I want to turn from, from my way. I want to get out of this mentality of my way or the highway. Amen. And I want to turn to you. And I want you to touch my heart. Is that your desire? If that's your desire, I want to ask that you stand tonight. I want to ask that you take a stand for Jesus Christ. Say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Are you with me? Friends, when everyone has had the opportunity to hear this message, Jesus is coming to take us home. He is coming to take his children home. So is that your desire to say, I want to be with you. I want to walk with you. I know there are some in here that are contemplating that decision. I know there are some of you that are thinking, Lord, I want to surrender all. But maybe you haven't made that decision. So tonight I want to give you that decision. If you want to say, Lord, I want to give you my heart. I want to join you. I want to ask that you come forward. If there's somebody in here that says, Lord, I want you to come into my heart. I want to join you. I want to follow you throughout the ceaseless stages of eternity. Brother. I want to ask that you come. And that you proclaim to the Lord that you want to join him in heaven throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. I know the Lord's speaking to your heart. I know he's talking to you. I told you, you are here by a divine appointment. You're not here because of a flyer. You're not here because someone invited you. You're here because the Lord spoke to you. So again, my friends, I want to invite you to come forward to take a stand for Jesus Christ to say, Lord, I want to join your remnant. I want to join your church. I want to proclaim this message. Amen. And friends, we're going to have prayer. And as we're praying, if the Lord speaks to you and you feel him talking to your heart, you can still come forward. Are you with me? And if you are desiring to join the church, if you are desiring to say, Lord, I want to join by baptism, I want to be rebaptized, I want to do whatever it might be. My friends, I want you to come so that we can be together with him. Are you with me? So that we can be ready when that glorious day happens, when he comes to take us home in those clouds of glory. Again, as we're praying, if the Lord speaks to you, you can still come forward or you can stay afterwards. We will be here for a little while. They're going to have snacks. Talk to us. Are you with me?
talk to me, talk to pastor, talk to an elder, talk to somebody. Because again, I know Jesus is speaking to you. You wouldn't be here if that wasn't true. So please bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you so much. Father, we thank you for what you do for us. Father, we love you. We love that you love us. You loved us before we were even born, Father. And so we pray this evening that you would continue to touch us, that you would continue to guide us. Help us to grow closer to you, Lord. You see all of us standing in this room, your church, your sanctuary, Lord. You see everybody in here that took a stand for you. So, Lord, I pray that you would just pour your spirit out upon every single one of us this evening. I pray, Lord, that you would touch our hearts, that you would come into us, that you would finish the work that you have started, Lord. I know that you're guiding us. I know that you're leading us. We wouldn't be here if that wasn't true. So we pray for you to do whatever it takes to prepare us for that great and glorious day when you come to take us home. Father, we love you. We thank you. We ask for all of these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, thank you all so much. We are so thankful and we are so just, we're just so thankful that we have been able to be here to do all of this with every single one of you. It has truly been a blessing. And again, <laughs> you will always be in my family's heart. Are you with me? Wherever we go. And if you don't have my phone number, you can get it. And we will stay in touch with one another, okay? Again, thank you all so much for coming. We will not be here tomorrow because that was from another presentation. Thank you all so much for coming. Have a wonderful night. We'll be here tomorrow morning for Sabbath. Yes. Yes, and they're also having snacks right over in the room over here.